runway is clear. Permission to launch the jets. Launch the jets, full ship. It's late October 2021, and HMS Queen Elizabeth is nearing the end of a long and arduous deployment that's taken her to the other side of the world. They've got Russian fighters at six miles. She's had a run-in with a Russian air force in the eastern Mediterranean. There it is, visual. Hello. Roger. Yeah, so we've got three Russian aircraft and the F-35 in the trail. And another with the Chinese Navy in the South China Sea. Probable submarine that continuing to be tracked assessed to be diving to depth to evade the force. The Queen Elizabeth is now in the Indian Ocean, and after six months at sea, she's starting the long journey home. That's right, guys, as soon as this one's straight, to get off the deck. Uh, Captain speaking. We now need to knuckle down, but naturally, we all start to turn our eyes a little bit towards home, albeit several thousand miles away. But we must avoid complacency, because in a ship like this, with its levels of complexity, operating aircraft, we could well end up hurting people or killing people. The fact is, we are entering what I consider to be the most dangerous phase of the deployment. Peter, who was very naughty, ran straight away to Mr. McGregor's garden and squeezed under the gate. First, he ate some lettuces and some French beans. Sniffle, 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 shuffle, sniffle. Once upon a time, there was a village shop. The name over the window was Ginger and Pickles. He roared an almighty roar. So the sailors come in here, record about a five minute story to their children. We, we record it and then send a recording to the families. So that means the children of our sailors can listen to mum or dad read a bedtime story. And it's so good. It, it's awful. It, it's, it's the hardest part of being away, missing their kids. And especially when people often are, you know, join the Navy single, um, and that's easy to go away. And then a few years later, they've got children, and it gets a lot harder. And this is just a small way that we have that we can support them in the process. And to this day, if you meet Nutkin and ask him a riddle, he will throw sticks at you and stamp his feet and scold and shout. Cuck, 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 crack. The end. Listen, Taylor, I love you loads. Uh, I miss you so much. You're the best human being on this earth. And I won't be too long. I'll be home soon. It is, it is the worst, because obviously she's doing bits at home and then she'll, she'll tell me about them and it feels like you're missing out. And then she feels like she's missing out because we can't do the stuff we usually do. I talked to her enough to find out what I need to find out, but it's not being there with her that's the hardest thing. Because she's... She obviously wants to be there, and I want to be there, but it's not as simple as that, is it? I had to sort my life out, and this is the only way I could have done it, really. I had a drug problem, and my life was in chaos. Absolute tatters. I needed to do it. I needed to do it. In less than two months, these sailors will be reunited with their families. But anything could happen in that time. The world is an unstable place, so it's vital that the F-35 stealth fighters are at full combat readiness and able to launch at a moment's notice. Launch the jets, two ship. Flight call death, bands across the bow. Abort, abort, abort. Suspend, suspend. So at present we're just trying to get some jets away, but there are quite a few seabirds and uh, gulls just off the ramp. They're causing a few problems because the last thing we want to do is launch a jet through those and then get sucked through either the lift fan or the intakes for the jet engine because uh, that'll cause some damage to the aircraft. So we're trying our best to try and dodge them at the moment. Birds are kind of a nuisance. Um, the ship can either blow its horn to try and you know scare them away or we just send someone to the top of the ramp to kind of wave their arms and hopefully scare them away but it could be a danger to you if one of those goes down the motor it's probably not gonna be a good day but um been lucky so far knock on wood yeah. wherever it is <laughs> okay let's give them a blast on the ship's horn all right see if this works <laughs> Ah, it's 
that worked. Mm. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are more. Where are they coming from? The birds linger for more than two hours. Birds and what are called bird strikes have been, uh, you know, the cause of a, of a number of quite nasty accidents around the world, really, one of the sort of perpetual hazards of aviation. We have this state-of-the-art warship, we have state-of-the-art aircraft. You can have more and more technology and more and more capability, but ultimately, uh, you, you know, nature is a very powerful force which we have to deal with every day, whether that is wildlife or the state of the sea or thunderstorms. It's, uh, it's part of the challenges, but then part of the rewards of uh, being able to, uh, to operate aircraft safely at sea. And what we're about to try using a shotgun, not to, to try and shoot the birds themselves, but to actually just put some noise into the, uh, into, into the air around them and to see if that will um, uh, dissuade them and cause them to uh, fly away and let us go flying. Uh, at last, that's done the trick. Launch the jet single. Read it, Pixley. Read it, Pixley. So we can sp spend billions on, like, the most advanced aircraft carrier in the world, but um, a few birds can ground all the jets, so all this technology that the Russians or the Chinese want to produce they should do is just follow us with follow us with a pack of seagulls. <laughs> we are doing some dangerous things out here, and we're doing them well, but it can change in a heartbeat. Um, and how we manage that risk and keep everyone focused on looking after one another is the most important thing. We take our eye off the ball, whether it be the machinery you're operating, the aircraft you're flying the weather conditions you face, everything has a vote in the outcome. And arguably, the, the human vote is often the most variable. Um, so that, that's really what my focus is on. We have to bring the ship home on the 10th of December with everyone safe and well to see their families. Theo says, uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to your dry brief. Talk about the procedures following an aircraft incident and also describe how search and rescue principles are applied. Pilots are continually briefed and debriefed about emergency procedures. So vital actions then, if we have to eject, uh, first thing we're going to do look, is look up, check the canopy, look for any twists and line overs and clear those. Visor up, mask off and inflate life preserver, like I said. Ejecting is always a last resort, but it can happen no matter how advanced an aircraft. Pilot flight jacket will give you a flotation angle of 45 degrees and you're self-right within five seconds. So if you are unconscious for any reason, or do end up face down in the water. Within five seconds, the life preserver will turn you around. Uh, These pilots are from 617 Squadron, the famous dam busters, made up here of RAF and naval pilots, some on their very first operational deployment. The F-35 is absolutely amazing. I love it. As you're sitting there ready to launch, you're watching the flight deck officer, and that's really your only focal point. It's just waiting for him to give the signal. First, he's going to tell you to convert. You hit the button. Then that's when the lift fan's going to engage, the doors open, and you hear it spool up, and there's a sort of screaming, high-pitched whine. It is absolutely outrageous. I think both in the cockpit and outside watching it, there's just such an incredible amount of power. And then you're waiting for his signal to launch. Once you come up on the power of the launch, there's no option to abort it at that point. You've got so much power behind the jet that it's going to be going off the end of the ship. And there's an almost uncomfortable feeling as you leave the ramp that you're not going fast enough to fly yet. And you see it um, as the jet leaves the ramp, the tailpipe angles down because it's just putting as much power as it can downwards to try and keep the jet airborne. And then you see it accelerate away. Especially coming from the ship, it's quite an odd sensation that you're just in the middle of the ocean. We also think about what we would do if we have an issue with the aeroplane, an absolute worst case if we get shot down or we need to eject over hostile territory, how we're going to hopefully keep ourselves safe and get back to friendly forces. OK, thank you. The sea's not too bad. You're clear down the back door. Ejecting or ditching into the sea is a constant risk. So the Merlin helicopters on the Queen Elizabeth 
mainly there for anti-submarine warfare, are the best means of rescuing a downed pilot. We're going to carry out a little bit of training for uh, our second role as search and rescue. We're going to use the winch to fish out this training aid from the water. Dave directs his pilot through the headset. It's precision work. Two o'clock now, ten. Two o'clock, eight. Two o'clock, five. Three, two, one, steady. Contact with the survivor. And survivor, clear of the water. Dave, 34, has been in the Navy for 14 years, much of which has been spent on operations away from home. Being separated from my family and my kids is the hardest part of the job. Uh, I do find now I've got two very young children. One's two, one's one. Uh, I thought I'd write them a song just so they can hear my voice a little bit. This one's been quite easy to write because uh, I end up just writing it as if I'm talking to my kids, which makes it a lot easier. And yeah, the words sort of just came out by themselves without much effort. Watching a video, you're learning to walk. I left you a baby, now you're starting to talk. You must wonder why your daddy's long been away. Though you might not have the words to say it. I hope you know I love you every day. Slow down, little princess. You're both in a race to grow up, and I know you can't stop, but I, I don't want to miss this. From hearing you take your first breath to walk your first step, slow down, little princess, slow down. Everyone on board will be missing someone, especially now after nearly seven months at sea. But a working warship is endlessly busy, so homesickness has to be set aside whilst vital work is undertaken, first and foremost to keep the helicopters and jets fully airworthy. Joe Joseph, 38, from Trinidad and Tobago, lives and breathes F-35s. What I do is um, ensure that the squadron gets any supplies that they need, anything from a little bolt, you know, washer, all the way up to a canopy that needs to be changed to keep the jets in the air. They need to be carefully looked after. They need to be taken care of, you know, like things like simple as corrosion. They need to be washed. You know, we can't just have them out here and not wash them. You know, it's like you're taking care of a baby, just as I said, you know, they wash, you know, fed. You have to caress them, yeah. Love and caress them. Yeah. <laughs> the jets, it's just amazing. The things that they can do, it's, oh, it's amazing to watch. Growing up home, my, like my family and my cousins, you know, we only see these things on movies. We, we don't have fighter jets back home. So I, I am living my dream. And I always see that from day one since I've been here, I'm, I'm actually living my dream. Everything I do is like I'm walking in a movie. We are Marine Corps, can't you say? Over half the F-35 jets on board belong to the U.S. Marine Corps, which is why over 300 Marines are on board to support and maintain them. Gonna run all day to the red and sun. Gonna run all day to the red and sun. Singing, I wanna be a drill instructor. I wanna be a drill instructor. Although independent of the ship's company, their sergeant major, John Beckett, has been keen that British sailors also benefit from the taste of the unique US marine culture. It's a good opportunity, and it, and it builds that integration piece. You know, that uh, it's good to have them there so they have a better understanding of what we do, how we train, who we are, uh, and then that just makes us tighter all the way around on the ship, as nations, everything. 
if I wanted to open it up to any of the Royal Navy that wanted to attend because they're going to learn something out of it, I know they will. And it's fun. It's a new experience for them. It's a story for them for the rest of their life. They'll talk about it forever. They'll be a recruiter for the Marine Corps because they'll talk about how awesome it was. Nicole Gildert, just 21 years old, is one of the first to volunteer for U.S. Marine Corps training. It's nice to push yourself and just unlock your full potential, see how far you will go as a person. It's interesting because I've done a lot of things that I never thought I'd ever do in my life, and it's all coming out on this ship. I just, I just always think back to that time, just being a 13-year-old cadet and just thinking of the day that I'd be in the Navy. And I almost didn't get in because I was temporarily medically unfit at first. So that put a spanner in the works. But now I'm here, I'm just, like, I'm so grateful. Even on my bad days when I think that, oh, maybe this isn't for me or maybe the Navy isn't what I thought it was. I just think back to those times as a cadet and I think, hang on a minute, I worked so hard to get here. Of course, it's not all going to be like lollipops and rainbows. Of course, it's not going to be easy. And of course, every day isn't going to be like the best day ever, but that's life and that's, that's the normality of it. Fight! Oh, shit. The US Marine Corps demands not only physical fitness, but also that life is lived according to a strict ethos. I am now, more than ever, committed to excellence in all that I do. Woo! What's up, Rick? I will demand of myself all of the energy, knowledge and skills I possess. So one of the important things I have to do is learn the non-commissioned office creed, uh, learn it by heart. So there's three paragraphs that I have to get through. It'll be a lot to learn. I am the backbone of the United States Marine Corps. I'm a Marine non-commissioned officer. Above all, I will be truthful in all I say or do. I will be honest with myself, with those under my charge and with my superiors. For though today I instruct and supervise in peace, tomorrow I may lead in war. Hey, I did it! <laughs> to help keep the pilots combat ready, there are two flight simulators on board, essential to help practice emergency procedures. It gets referred to often on the ship as a big PlayStation 5, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible bit of kit. I know my five-year-old lad would probably quite enjoy sitting here and having a go. Uh, it's brilliant. The simulators, they're absolutely critical to practice our high-end warfighting, but also for the emergency handling, the drills for a poor launch off the ramp. We practice it in the simulator. A lot of the drills, like the ejection seat drills, need to happen instinctively. So if we have a poor launch off the ramp, that's an immediate action drill. You haven't got time to sit and think and get your cards out, obviously. That is an emergency that gets drilled into us from day one. Many apply to become fighter pilots, but few get through the incredibly demanding selection process. 29-year-old Hux is on his first operational deployment. So I grew up in a kind of aviation enthusiast family, I'd say. My dad is a light aircraft engineer. My mum's got her pilot's license as well. Uh, my uncle is an airline pilot, and uh, now my sister has her pilot's license as well. I think I first went in an airplane when I was four years old. Um, so it was sort of a natural part of my life. And then I left school. I just really liked the idea of flying fast jets. Uh, Charlie One, air crew walking. But fast jets, really, nobody gets to touch them unless you're in the military. I got a scholarship from the Navy. And then, uh, yeah, I haven't really looked back. In quite a short period of time, I've gone from being a kid at school to now flying a 100 million pound airplane off an aircraft carrier. and getting that sort of international attention because we are at the cutting edge of, of military capability at the moment. I've got a girlfriend at home as well, and she's definitely very proud. Sarah's back home, probably missing me a lot as I am her. You know, it's the first time for me going away on a ship and especially flying the F-35 off the deck. It's very exciting. Fish, bit of fish, bit of Friday night fish. Hey, Jamie. Steam! I hate flying, yeah. It's not nice. Helicopters are even worse. It's just scary, isn't it? Like, I, I, I don't get, yeah? Someone could explain it to me a million times, but in my head, it goes off and it just keeps going up. I don't know why it don't just go down. Like that, do you know what I mean? I don't get it. Cos you're going up and you think... <laughs> yeah, it's not a nice feeling. I hate flying. 
Say so soon it'll be a show to the pilot. Yes, 100%, yes. Too much responsibility, isn't it? HMS Queen Elizabeth heads west. Every mile is a mile closer to home. But still, there's no let up in the tempo of activity on the flight deck. Pilots and deck crews forever fine tuning their launch and landing procedures. It takes time, money and dedication to keep these F-35s in lethal working order. They got to get a hammer. In here is the canopy. So for them to change the canopy, because the one that's presently on the jet, there is an issue with it. So this is one of the spares that I issued out to the engineers to get it changed. So a canopy, it is a lot for F-35s. Just kicking around 100 mil, kicking around 500 grand, you know, that's my dream house in here. Is that my dream house in a box? <laughs> it looks like something from Star Wars, isn't it? <laughs> it's like a privilege to be a Rastafarian in the, in the military. There is gives and take, you know. We, we can't go all the way, just like, you know, everyone always asks me the question, do you smoke marijuana? You know, things like that is what you don't do. But, you know, there's other traits, you know, you, you live a humble life, you know, love and peace with everyone. I look at it as the end goal, because what we're serving for, we all want that peace to come in the end. So it's more for the end goal. And if we have to do this to get to that point, th that gives me peace. Goes clear visually. Positions off swatch, intended DFC 025, speed 20, ship not steady. Off swatch, Roger. We kiss as she's making my wish come true underneath the mistletoe. So, yeah, I've had a bit of a stab at writing a Christmas song. Yeah. Sort of tell the story about going home um, after a long time at sea and going home for Christmas. So it's. Nice. It's great, it's not finished yet. I've come down to show Phil, my singing partner, what we've got. We've been playing together for over 10 years. So this is the, fir this is the first time that I'm gonna get to hear what it, what it is we might be performing. I wanna get that nervous tension about it. It's like seven months at sea being away, so it is like, it is like yeah. nervous. I know, I know my wife feels it as well. And I whisper, Merry Christmas, darling. Been a really long wait, I know. I miss this. All that I wish for was coming back to see you after sailing home. That's all I got so far. Right. <laughs> I probably need to mention the word snow a few more times. <laughs> Encore, encore. Morning, everyone. Black History Month is happening now. So Sunday the 31st, we want to do a church service on that day. So already in talks with the Bish. Church with a difference. Yeah. 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 It's more of like Caribbean, African, so it's more upbeat. Uh, okay. It's not your, not your normal amazing grace kind of thing. It, it'll be like with a different flavor. Yeah. This is, for us on board, is to showcase to the crew we do have other experiences, we do have other talents. So just like the church service that we're going to do, you know, there is a different way. It's not that we serve a different God. It's the same God, it's just a different way of how we do it based on your cultural experiences. So we're trying to incorporate that into the normal church service to give them like a cultural taste of what is happening. My plans, what I have, if we do doing that, is I'm going to have a big screen up. I'm going to have things like Carnival. I'm going to have my steel pan out there telling people about Trinidad okay. and Tobago. Mind you, steel pan originated from Grenada. No chance. <laughs> no chance. <laughs> and Trinidad took and that has been... No, 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 no. Fifth Street. So die, when, die. You, when you showcase the steel pan, just make sure and say <laughs> it started in Grenada. It didn't start. No, you didn't. That is my island thing. Well, until you show me the ducks, Right? And, right? 
but the things you're going to get evaluated on. So we'll practice eyes right. I'll go over with it and I'll show you all how to do it. We'll actually practice eyes right today. They would give, they would turn about and give eyes right. And they would wait for whoever's trooping the line to come by. As they come by, they follow them. Order! Help! Steel Jumpman started in Grenada. Your country took it and you became ex-sponsor. I have to give you that. No, 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 and no, no. And even the tuners were saying steel band started in Grenada. Yeah, but what? And Trinidad took it. Because I know steel band was started in Trinidad and Tobago. No. Right? No. It you, was. No. Trinidad is so big. Uh -huh. Trinidad no. is bigger than Grenada. Oh, ten, two. Hey. Oops. We created steel pan. No, you did not. You, you probably had the idea. Well, let, let's say you had the idea, one. but we created steel pan to what it is today, right? And I said yes. You 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 take it, made it your own, and then just blow it up. So right now, Trinidad has it locked, but Grenada is where that started from. And do not try. To yeah, yeah, but we created steel pan. Nah, you can't create something that you you never owned to begin with. Got on. Tell them. Right. Face. Left. Face. Tobago and Grenada was one, and then we let you loose. Let me loose? Yeah. We lost you in the midst of the war. You didn't lose, we, we know, let you up. to reclaim. You yeah. can't reclaim. <laughs> coming to reclaim. You can't reclaim at all. <laughs> but your country stole my steel pan. Come now and stole my island. What next? We, we didn't steal what? anything. However, steel pan is good either. Yeah, walk away with defeat until oh, the 20th. Oh, <laughs> March, left, right, left, right, left. I'm so grateful for these opportunities. Nearing 11 months in the Navy, um, so still not quite a year. And already I've done all of this, you know, I've crossed the line, trained with the Marines martial arts, now done that leadership course, you know? Again, how many British people can say they've done that? It's not many. Order, get it! Today, has been set aside for vital aircraft maintenance, meaning the flight deck is free for recreation. Okay, take the strain! <laughs> One last thing before getting home is the Interdepartmental Tug of War Championship. Always a hard fought affair. The final is between the stokers and the logisticians of seven Juliet mess. Shocking vibes. <laughs> How are you feeling about Arnie heading home? I'm a bit nervous about going home after so long away. This has become our world. There's things like we get our washing done here, yep. we, we get told when to eat, what to eat, when to go to work. We get told everything what to do and then going home it's going to be like whoa you've got all this time what's good ralph barber the ship's chaplain will always provide a sympathetic ear but particularly now as people prepare for homecoming 
not always so straightforward for a sailor at sea. And it's all about reintegrating you back into normal life because we spend seven and a half months in a very abnormal way of living. Yeah. And you're going to spend most of your leave actually just adjusting back to normality. Because you, you're with people like 24 seven. Like I live in a room with eight girls like, yeah. and I'm with them all day, every day. Like going home is going to be like... It's going to be really odd. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like people don't understand that at home. And they're like, oh, did you have the best time? And I'm like, that's, it's a deployment, yeah. not a holiday. I think because everyone at home, no one's been to I know I've got to go away and do these things, which was great, but going away for such a long time, like having no freedom, having no choice, having no control over anything, like, is a stressful experience. And like, obviously this deployment's like no other, but people don't understand that, like, like, my family think that I've been in bloody, like, on an actual world tour, backpacking, I think. <laughs> like, you've had a great time, but... And now we'll sing the legal hymn, Eternal Father, from today. deployment at sea binds the ship's company in ways few civilians would understand. This is the military, this is the Navy. This is where we live, this is where we eat and sleep and breathe, and we live with each other. Even though we're on a ship and we're traveling here, there and everywhere, this, this is our home. And I think that's important to remember as well. You're not the only one here, you're not the only one experiencing what you're experiencing. We all are, all 1,600 of us on board. You happy, Nicole? I am happy, Chris. Um, don't get me wrong, not every day is a good day. Not every day is a positive day. But it's when you have views like this and when you remember who is around you, what you're doing and why you're here, you, you appreciate it more, you, you are happy. Um, there has been times when I've been upset quite a lot. Um, I've pulled that curtain across on my bunk and just cried, as have most of us, but things can get to you. You can let the smallest things get to you as well. I think feelings on here are amplified and it's, it is so hard to remember that this, this isn't permanent, that this is only temporary and that it's only temporary how we feel, but when you're in the moment, you just letting out a good cry, whether it's with the curtain closed or in the shower, so no one can hear you. It does help to cry, and it's and it's okay to cry. We will pray for our friends and family at home, those who love and miss us, and those who we miss and love. And we look forward to our time of being reunited with them. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Um, is there any how many? How many? If I'm really honest, I've struggled, man. Like, I've still been happy. I've still been in my pit. I've struggled. Like, I've, I thought, fucking, this is never ending. Like, and it has been fucking with me a little bit, but like, I, like I've said, I can hide things like that. I can sort of, which is not healthy, I know. I can sort of just stuff it down where some people just can't do that. And I'll, and, and I'll be there for everyone that needs it. And people know that, people know that. I've gained some really good mates, some proper good pals. And people do make you laugh. And laughing, it, it gets rid of everything, doesn't it? Like, every pain you had laughing just fucks it right off. And yeah, we do have a right laugh, but the most important thing you can do is to just keep going. I mean, the, that, this, this trip has taught me that hands down, you just, you cannot stop, because if you do, you're going to end up in a lot worse place. And who knows, if you keep going, where you might end up. But if you stop, there's no chance for you at all. Everybody, I'm not talking about you.
Probably the most enthusiastic shaky shovers hand in the history of the Royal Navy. <laughs> it's wonderful. Because of COVID, no one's done that for about a year and a half. So that's the first time I shared a piece of people in a year and a half. So to do it so enthusiastically, wonderful. It was really good. It was great energy. Everyone was dancing. You could literally feel it in the room, the energy. And it was just so nice. I wish it was like that every single week. So if we go from the first chorus. The footsteps come, I hear you running, racing through the house. Go straight in with The butterflies start, a flicker in my heart. I feel my chest start to glow. I'm shaking as I kneel to greet you. Sorry. I just can't believe. OK, yeah, I can do that. Shall we go from I'm shaking? Yeah. Three. I'm shaking as I kneel to greet you. I just can't believe how much you have grown. Sorry. HMS Queen Elizabeth heads for Duckham in Oman. Some sailors are flying home early as an advance party to prepare for the ship's homecoming a month from now. Oman itself is closed because of COVID. But every effort has been made to give the British sailors a taste of the country. They've built us a little village, mostly out of containers, but it looks like a sort of uh, uh, part of the festival season in the UK. We've got stores selling souvenirs, shawarma, kebabs, burgers, pizzas, a bit of beer and shisha. So, yeah, it's uh, making the best of it. Dave Emery, the singing helicopter observer, is one of those going home early, but for a very special reason. Within two to three weeks of me getting back, there's going to be uh, there's going to be number three child's going to get born, so uh, yeah, I'm really excited for that as well. As well as seeing my uh, two kids for the, uh, for the first time in seven months, I'm very quickly going to have a third as well. Uh, with Christmas around the corner, so it's going to be mayhem. But I kind of like that, and I'm quite excited for it. This is Ruben. So when I left, um, he was still crawling. As you can see, he's now he's now walking. As great as it is on board with with everyone around. You do feel like you miss uh, special parts of, of you know, your family's life, really. So I think that is uh, certainly the hardest part about being away. So the advanced party plus Dave will fly back today. But the vast majority of the ship's company still have a long sea voyage in front of them. We've just spent six weeks at sea again. Um, you know, no stops, no rests. Oh, I'm so ready for home. I just want to see my dog. I'm my parents, obviously, but like, I just want to want to hug my dog. I miss I miss animals so much, so that would be that would be nice to see. We're definitely going to do some work on the Christmas song. Everyone who's left on board will be coming home at Christmas time, so and that's what the song is about: is people coming back, seeing their families at Christmas time. So we're going to go back and uh, have a lot of fun recording it and finish writing it, really. HMS Queen Elizabeth sails from Oman through the Gulf of Aden into the Red Sea and back through the Suez Canal to the Mediterranean. The Eastern Mediterranean is Russia's backyard, so the ship must be on her guard. The F-35s are primed for action. Engine starts to get the aircraft that are taxiing on the runway and in the taxiway now. Airborne, then we'll bring the other two across to the pits. Same detail, single launches. Runway is clear. Wing search checks complete. Permission to launch the jets. Launch the jets, full ship. <laughs>
Floor queue hold ship has correct for recovery of fixed wing aviation at minute five zero. Get down, get down. Positions P1, command open line, flash. One times F-35 has crashed on launch. Visual on the pilot ejecting, position unknown. Do you hear that? Aircraft dished, aircraft dished, aircraft dished. Away, port and starboard sea boats. Post crash management teams, close up. Crash and deck alarm system has been sounded, the seaboard has been launched, this hero is airborne within the force. With an aircraft ditched, the sea boats are launched immediately. A life may depend on it. Everybody's keeping their eyes on an object in the water. Is it wreckage or a body? The fastest the sea boats got away before is nine minutes. Today, it's away in three. The object in the water is part of the pilot's seat. So what of the pilot? By an extraordinary stroke of good fortune, his parachute caught on the edge of the ski jump and quick-thinking aircraft handlers grabbed him before he could be swept into the water and under the ship. The jet has sunk to the bottom of the sea and the pilot is being escorted off the flight deck for immediate medical attention. So we just heard the general alarm go off and it was an aircraft ditch, but there was potentially a pilot in the water. They say don't run on a warship, but to be completely honest, that was out the window. You know, everybody was, we were in the mess deck. We normally know roughly if it's going to be an exercise that day or something. So we're kind of on our toes, but this being a safeguard incident, everybody sprinted, um, you know, myself included. There was, everybody was up and out of the mess deck. Everybody, you know, warfare ratings, wapus, everybody that was around. It's really good because this is what we practice for at the end of the day. One of the ship's fixed external cameras caught exactly what happened. The aircraft appeared to lose power at the last second. The pilot ejected just in time, his parachute snagging on a redundant light fitting that was due to be removed. It probably saved his life. It was another regular day. Uh, aircraft launched and, you know, almost immediately, you know, every, every sense in my body you know, with multiple thousand launches under my belt, knew that something wasn't quite right. It didn't sound right, it didn't look right. Um, and as he, you know, as he came towards me and came past me, you know, my, my instinctive reaction was to run after him up the ramp. Uh, obviously tried to stop the jet, uh, realised that that wasn't going to be an option for him. And then, you know, what happened, happened. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you, yeah. Like, genuinely, I'm... And what of the pilot, who lives to tell his tale? You've got angels looking I mean, over you. It's Hux, who dreamed of flying since he was a small boy. Everything looked normal up to the point where you run up on the power and then release the brakes for the takeoff. And about a second after releasing the brakes, it, it seemed to accelerate well, and then it just stopped accelerating when you can normally continue to feel that push in your back of, of uh, picking up speed. Thought I'd try and slam on the brakes and see if I can stop it before the end of the ramp but that didn't work either, so I kind of knew in my mind already at that point that it was going to roll off the end of the ship, not with the speed to fly. Uh, so pretty instinctive reaction at the end to just pull the handle and, and get out of there, which thankfully, the ejection seat all worked exactly as advertised. And I remember just feeling that just rapid acceleration, like just a really strong version of a roller coaster at Alton Towers or something. But uh, then watching the jet just nose off the end of the ship into the water below me, and then very quickly, you're kind of at the top of the ejection where the seat drops away. And then I glanced down, just saw the sea underneath me. So I was probably only a couple of hundred feet, maybe 300 feet above the water. So immediately just started thinking about uh, pulling the life jacket and getting rid of my oxygen mask because I figured I was going to go in the sea. Yeah. And then about a second later, I could just see out the corner of my eye the flight deck of the ship starting to appear beneath me again. So I realized, actually, I'm probably not going to go in the sea. I'm going to make the deck. Landed probably about three feet from the bow of the ship. Yeah, then the flight deck team were there within seconds, like honestly seconds of me landing. They were helping me up and 
uh, yeah, fortunately, walked away from it. So you've got some, some bruising around your neck. Yeah, what is that from? So um, that's from where the canopy detonates. So when you pull the ejection handle, the first thing that happens before the seat goes out is the, uh, there's a plastic explosive charge that effectively just cuts the canopy in half. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, you get a bit of splatter from that plastic explosive, which looks like a bad shaving rash. But I'm fortunate to say that's probably my worst injury. So actually, pretty happy, yeah. <laughs> it's the reality of what we do, I think, you know, uh, I say slightly tongue-in-cheek sometimes, you know, today was a good day, no-one died. Um, but that's absolutely true. You know, what we do every day, we come out here, um, you know, we do our eight hours, you know, however long we're out on deck for, and we just kind of take it for granted that this is normal life, you know? It's, it's what we do for a living, and actually, um, it does have very, very serious consequences on occasion. Uh, fortunately, uh, you know, with the incident that happened, there weren't any serious consequences to life. Obviously, loss of an aircraft is a huge issue, um, and, you know, and a loss to the Navy and the RAF. Um, but the pilot survived, the seat did his job, and it just is a bit of a reality check for all of us of, you know, what we do every day is, you know, it's pretty on the edge. This year kind of shocks us back into reality that these things are still possible. No matter how much you practice and you, you play the game and you do what you need to do, it's still practical and it's, it's a man-made machine and anything can go wrong at any time. So it's pretty practical. Yeah, it's probably a machine you break down <laughs> just as we're interviewing, just as we're talking about, you know, it's man-made activities down, happening now. So just now we hear a pipe, a machine you break down, machine you break down. Yeah. I know we've lost a jet, but that's not the most important thing, is it? The fact is we ain't lost a pilot. Pilot's all that matters. Who gives a fuck about the plane? Build another plane. They can't build another dad for some kid, can they? Do you know what I mean? All right, I'm out. Yeah, cheers, cheers. mate. Enjoy the rest of the deployment, anyway. Yeah. I'll see you next time. Yeah. Hux will now be transferred ashore for further medical checks before being flown home. Cheers, Chris. Good touch. Thank you, yeah. I'll speak to you soon. F-35, now on the seabed, will be recovered as soon as possible by a specialist salvage vessel and a full investigation launched into the crash. But that's not what's on people's minds right now. Good evening, Queen Elizabeth, uh, Captain speaking. It is with great pride that I speak to you tonight. Um, as you know, we've had significant events today, uh, the loss of an aircraft and the safe recovery of a pilot. Uh, it's testament to the quick thinking, consummate professionalism, training and preparations which enabled us to get through today uh, in a safe manner uh, and testament to the kit and equipment we've operated uh, that brought this pilot safely back on board uh, in a safe manner. Uh, and I'm pleased to say he is well. If you operate at this level doing the things that we do, these things do happen and uh, we were prepared. And I'm extremely grateful for those who reacted in the proper manner today. Uh, well done. Good night. HMS Queen Elizabeth, bowed but unbeaten, heads for home after nearly 200 days on the high seas. And then we're going to fly one day, which is going to be delayed. So we're free, and then we'll work out the last one when we get there. Tomorrow, the ship arrives in Portsmouth. But the pilots leave today, flying their F-35s to their base on land. We've all worked very closely together for the last seven and a half months. Um, but I have to say, getting home is, uh, is hugely exciting. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But yeah, we'll look, definitely everyone I will have no doubt will look back with fond memories on, on events that have occurred. There's obviously been some difficult times over the seven and a half months, but that's to be expected. From the ship perspective, you know, both sides have learned a huge amount as we re-embark on carrier strike over the next 20, 30 years. This is the beginning of it.
We'll stand at ease. Once we get close into a round tower, if you see your family and you can see them waving at you, wave back at them, OK? This is the end I've of mixed the feelings. You know, the whole ship's company have endured for seven months away from friends and loved ones. I mean, it borderline superhuman efforts to go on for so long in such a, an environment where we're learning every day about how to operate this brand new platform and having to adjust and change things to adapt. It's a constant evolution. But the most important thing is everyone goes home for a, a, a much deserved rest for, for Christmas with their families. It's been phenomenal. It's also been one of the toughest deployments I've ever been on. The conditions, uh, at times with COVID, the restrictions, the isolation protocols, the runs ashore <laughs> that I would take away from them with no notice as nations change their policies and restrictions. You know, it's been incredibly, incredibly demanding. And yet, as you see, you go around, they're just still smiling. Uh, and it, you know, it's, you know, it really does take, you know, it leaves you speechless on occasions when you see you know, how resilient they are, how positive they still stay, and how professional they've been. You, know, you form bonds with people in that period of time that you'll never form again. And, and for those young people, you know, they are old and wise now, well beyond their years. For a lot of people, they'll now go to different ships, but they'll bump into one another again in, in bars or in whatever, and there'll just be a look, you know, that, you know, I was there, we were in the same mess deck, we went through that together. We did the run ashore that wasn't a run ashore. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we did the crossing the line ceremony together, and no one will ever be able to take that away from them. Ship's company. It's the first deployment of the carrier. It's a maiden deployment, and to be a part of that, and to be a part of the, sh the ship's company that, that the very first to, t to, to take this carrier around the world and to broadcast British aircraft carrier capability and power, of course you have to be proud of that. Maiden deployment. We did it. We made it work. Yeah. I've loved absolutely every minute of it. It has been a bit of a roller coaster ride, um, a deployment like no other. Uh, this has been a once in a generation trip for, for, for most people on board, um, kind of a resurgence of, of our Royal Navy. Uh, and it hasn't panned out like anybody planned it would. <laughs> it's a brilliant trip. It's everything I've ever wanted. I'm not sure if you have to have something wrong with you to join the Navy. <laughs> because when you put all of us together, I don't know how we get through it, but we get through it one way or another. I just spoke my granddad. <laughs> Nobody is the same person as what they were when they left the UK. You know, you say to the girls, oh, we'll stay in touch, we'll meet up, and probably will do but you're never going to recreate what we have now in that mess. Uh, that's going to be lost and you have to leave that behind. So that's, that's quite sad. Whether I want to do one of these again, I'm not sure yet. I didn't like this roller coaster. <laughs> but if you ask me in a few months time, would I go to see again? I'd probably be like, yes, it's fantastic. <laughs> but right now, I just want to go home. <laughs> We're here, we're home, Are seven we months completed. Shocking Good. vibes. <laughs> Come here, young. <laughs> Chris, we've made it. Yeah. We are my ladies. Is it Chris? I'm a rich man. <laughs> it's Christmas, so the lights are new. It's, oh, it's just incredible. I just, I cannot believe we're home. Like, we, we've done this and just sheer pride. I've realised a lot about myself, to be fair. 
like, as I left, I was, I was still acting like a kid all the time. Do you know what I mean? I wasn't really taking life seriously. And it's been, it's been an eye opener, it really has. If anything, it has helped me in that way. I've grown up. Oh, it's fucking lovely. I can't wait. And obviously, Taylor don't know I'm coming today. So I'm going to. Mental. It's going to be mental. All I want, get that gangway out. Let me get off the giant. Get that gangway out. I'm off. I'm off skis. Overhead, all the stars looking down on our house. Cold and bright, the curtains closed. But the chimney smoke says, come, it's warm inside, all at once. And the ache from each day I've been gone. Seven months, it fades to the past. I'm here at last, this Christmas has finally come. The butterflies start, a flicker in my heart. I feel my chest start to glow. I'm shaking as I ring the doorbell. I've missed this, all that I wished for Was coming back to see you after sailing home From inside And I'm hearing the voice of a child Calling out The footsteps come I hear you running, racing through the house The butterflies start A flicker in my heart Feel my chest start to glow I'm shaking as I kneel to greet I just can't believe how much you've grown I'm with this Merry Christmas, darling Leave our tears out here in the snow Just this, it's all that I wish for And now I'd like to see you at the same home Same home I love you so much. Yeah. <laughs>